Okay. All right. So, oh. all right. So, uh, welcome to today's presentation. Uh, my name is Hiro McMeekin. My pronouns are he, we, him, and his. And I currently serve in a dual capacity. I'm currently the Dean of Student Learning at Central Carolina Community College. And then the other 50% of my time, I spend at the um, North Carolina Student Success Center as the Director of Equity and Pathways. And so I appreciate all of you being here today. Um, I hope you're um, expecting some engaging content. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna give you some information and then I'm gonna rely a lot on all of you to share some of your expertise and your experiences uh, so that we can all help each other. Um, I'm a firm believer that community learning is uh, probably some of the, one of the best learning uh, strategies there is. Um, but yeah, so uh, you're here for psychological safety for you and your colleagues. Um, and again, you will get the recording and then I'll also share the presentation and then there's some other resources I'm gonna share with you as well. But um, so just know that because people always uh, ask that. Um, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand. If you know how to use the reactions button at the bottom of your screen, uh, raise your hand and you know, feel free to um, you know, unmute yourself and then we can have conversations and things of that nature. And again, we will be using the whiteboard uh, function in Zoom. And I'll talk, you know, for those of you who have never done that, I'll walk you through it. So then that way we can share um, all the information uh, within each other, okay? So with that being said, let's go and get started. Um, Today's agenda, we'll talk about why this matters, um, what is psychological safety, um, uh, and then we'll go through those four uh, safeties and what they actually mean. Uh, we'll finish with a summary and then we'll open it up for questions and suggestions, but hopefully you will have some questions and suggestions as, as we're going through it, okay? And so with that being said, um, why this matters. So um, for those of you who may be new to what psychological safety is, uh, Google did a project called Project Aristotle where they wanted to measure um, some of their, they have these teams uh, across the company. And so they had these teams and they were trying to figure out like why some teams were outperforming others. And so they did this huge study uh, to figure out like, was it, you know, the, the salary that certain people were getting? Uh, was it their education? You know, were they coming in with a lot of, what was it, you know, older um, workers? Was it younger workers? Things like that. And they were just trying to figure out like, what is the most common denominator here that some teams are outperforming others? And so after they were able to do all their research and look through everything, what they found out was psychological safety was the most important factor in their performance. And so the teams that had high psychological safety outperformed the ones that didn't um, by, by tenfold. And so it's just one of those things that became very important. And once they started sharing this message, people started doing their own research, looking at their own organizations, and they were able to figure out like, oh, wow, like this really is important. And so that's why we're going to be uh, in here. And that's hopefully that's what brought you here to even think about. So uh, first question I want to ask is, um, have you ever been a part of an organization that was dominated by fear? And, and when we say organization, we're talking about the whole organization. It could just be your division, your department, um, things like that. So have you ever been a part of an organization where people were scared to speak up, scared to offer input, anything like that? Um, if you can use the reaction, uh, the hand raise uh, reaction button, just so we can get a, a glance of uh, if people have been, uh, ever had this experience. I know I have, so I could definitely uh, raise my own hand. <laughs> Okay, so a couple of folks. Um, oh, and more keep coming in. Okay, so yes. Um, and so for those of you that have been in an organization, you can put your hand back down. For those of you that have been in an organization that was dominated by fear, let's ask, how did you respond and how did other people respond? So um, if anybody is willing to either share, maybe we can get one or two volunteers to just share um, or put in the chat. Um, if you're willing, if not, we could move on, but I just want to open it up if, you know, folks, anybody have anything they want to share? Um, so I see, uh, is it Rehar? Am I saying that correctly? Do you want to share? Or you still have your hand up from the question? Okay, three, where, okay, where are they at? Let's see. Uh, Oh, that's me. Oh, Ms. Jones. Okay, Ms. Jones, you want to share? Yes, good morning, Hiram. So good morning. in my one of my previous um experiences with the surrounding amount of fear that we had, personally, I shut down a hundred percent. Um 
my coworkers and I, it, it was almost as if we were walking on eggshells. Um, we would come in, stay focused. Sometimes we would skip lunch. We went into our little 15 minute breaks just to get a breath of fresh air. We were, we felt as if we had to stick in this one box and it was sort of, um, it was draining. Even though yeah. we weren't doing a lot, it was draining, you know, but just for me personally, it, every day I pretty much had a headache or I was ill to my, my stomach. It was something. Yeah, Ms. Jones, I thoroughly appreciate you sharing that. Um, and for those of us uh, that have had similar experiences, um, maybe not exactly the same, but just similar. And I even see in the chat, Shannon mentioned it, you know, just shutting down. Yes. Um, and that's what we want to either try to prevent from happening, or if it is happening to you right now, like what are some things that we could do to try to get out of it or, you know, mitigate some of those uh, feelings and experiences. And so, um, uh, a former executive vice president for Walmart, um, they said that, you know, speaking up in a toxic culture is one of the most difficult decisions you'll ever make in your career, right? So it's just, if you're in that situation, like, what are some things you could do about it? And if you're not in that situation or have never been, count your blessings, okay? Because uh, I've been in that situation. I wouldn't even be at the community college had I not been in a situation like that as well. So uh, I worked at a previous institution before I went to a community college. Um had, you know, just had a horrible, horrible experience towards the end. And so then, you know, I did one thing I knew is like, I don't have to be here. So, you know, start looking elsewhere. Luckily, I was able to find uh, something at a community college. And it was like one of the best decisions I made in my life, because then it started me to where I am now. And so again, um, if you've never been in it, great. If you have, you understand what that's like. And so we're going to talk about, you know, what that looks like. Um, so one thing I'm going to uh, repeat uh, a couple times throughout here is that all humans, have uh, this need to belong. They, we all long to belong, okay? So we all have that. And so no matter what, even if people say like, oh, I, I like to be by myself and stuff like that. No, you, you like to be by yourself to a certain extent. At some point, you still wanna connect with others. And so that's what we just need to really understand. And so whenever we can foster that, we need to do that. If, if, if we can't, then that's another, um, you know, something we need to think about. And so this is what happens when psychological safety is high. Um, you tend to take more ownership over what's going on around you. Uh, you tend to put in more effort, even when it's not you know, being measured or looked at. Um, you tend to learn more and you're more willing to uh, solve some issues, right? And so that's what happens when it's high. So if your organization or wherever you're working at right now is doing that, please tell them to keep doing that. And you know, um, if it is not broke, don't fix it, okay? Um, this is what happens when it's low though. So for those people that have experienced this, uh, somebody already put, right? They put it in the chat, you shut down, you self-censor, uh, you start trying to figure out like, how can I just avoid, you know, and do the least amount and just self-preservation. So even speaking to what Ms. Jones was sharing, it's like, I shut down, you know, didn't want to, you know, um, uh, contribute as much things of that nature, right? And that's a natural human uh, uh, experience when you feel like there's not, the psychological safety is low. So what are the four needs to establish psychological safety? First is that all people want to be included, okay? So we all long to belong, all right? And so here's a question to ask for yourself. Um, do you believe all people are equal? Um, in what capacity do you believe that? And then do you treat them as such, right? Because some people think like, oh yeah, I treat everybody the same and I treat everybody fairly and you don't, you know? So um, we all do different things and we'll get more into that, but um, you don't treat everybody the same, but do you treat them equitably in, in a sense that you know, you're know you giving them the, uh, the experience or how they want to be treated as much as possible? Um, all people want to learn. So not only do you want to be included, but you also want to be able to, um, you know, learn about what's around you, your surroundings. You want to learn more about what you're doing and things of that nature. So um, think about the people around you. Do you encourage them to learn and grow? And especially for those of you that may be faculty members and teach and things like that, are you doing this in the classroom as well? You know, like, are you encouraging people to learn and grow? And so, um, and then do you do that even when they don't have the confidence to do so or, the, you know, uh, they're making mistakes and we'll talk more about that. Uh, all people want to contribute in some way. So everybody wants to give of themselves in some capacity. And so are we allowing people to do that? Um, do we allow people to do it the way that they want to do it? Um, it doesn't mean that it's always right, but do they feel comfortable enough to want to share what they know or, you know, how they would like to do things and stuff like that. So they're not being shut down for what they believe. And then last but not least is um, all people want to be able to challenge things when they think it could either be better or if it's not being done right. And so if something's not working for them, how do we get through this? And so that's what uh, everybody wants to be able to have that opportunity. It doesn't mean you do it, 
but you at least want the opportunity because there's some times where, you know, maybe you don't say anything and there are other times where you should. And so, but there are some times if you're in that, in a low psychological safety um, environment, you're not going to say anything. And I'll tell you firsthand, uh, you know, I'm going to try to be as transparent as I can throughout this is there is a number of times where when I was in that environment where it had low psychological safety, if I saw something not going necessarily the right way, I wouldn't say anything because it was just like, why? You know, it's like, I'm not, you know, what I want to share is not being valued anyway. So what's the point? And then things would, you know, just get worse. As long as it wasn't hurting students, I'd be like, you know, whatever. It, 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 it affects itself in some way. And that wasn't the right attitude um, to have. But at the same time, that's how I was feeling at the time. And I was still, you know, relatively young in my professional experience. So, you know, didn't really understand all the nuances that may be coming from that. So, uh, yeah. So Blake says, uh, you know, it's frustrating when your contributions are not valued. Yes, indeed. You know, because again, we all want to give of ourselves. We want to give of our time and energy. Um, you know, I hope people are coming to work, not just for a paycheck, but then also, uh, you know, to want to do something, make something better than how it is. Right. And so, and then when you know that you want to do that, or you have an idea that could do more of that, and it's not being honored, um, that becomes very frustrating. And we'll talk more about that. So, um, yeah. And then this is the other thing too. We have to be able to look at ourselves and you know, have the humility to understand that we don't have all the answers and are we willing to learn more and uh, honor what other people may know. And just because somebody challenges us, does it, you know, not taking it personal. Maybe they, you know, a lot, sometimes people say like, oh, I think we can make this better. And people take it personal. Like, oh, you're saying that I'm not doing something right or I'm not doing it. It's like, that has nothing to do with it. We're trying to make the, the, we need to, you know, make sure we have the same shared vision and things that we may not do it the same way, but as long as we have the same shared vision, let's, let's um, you know, connect on that. So let's get down to these four psychological safeties. Um, the first one is inclusion safety. And to me, this is probably the biggest one because a lot of times this just gets looked over in my opinion. So um, what I would like you to do is to think uh, back. So to answer this first question for yourself. And some of us have more of these than others, right? So um, if you think about maybe there was a time that you asked a question in class and your teacher ignored you, um, you know, you had a great idea and your boss like or your supervisor criticized it without any solutions or any uh, support, um, whether it was in a meeting in front of other folks or just with you, you know, so just think about that. Um, maybe you pronounced something wrong and somebody picked on you for that. Um, you know, you got cut from a team, whatever that was, um, you know, um, one of the most common ones, too, is, you know, maybe you work with a group and they all go to lunch and they didn't invite you, you know, so um, those kind of things. Right. So just think about those kind of things. And so we have all felt at some point and I can say all in this in this uh, thing, I think we've all felt at some point where we felt like excluded. And so what did that you know, what did that do to us? How did we feel? And the thing about being excluded is that. The, um, the same uh, part of the brain that experiences that, experiences that kind of psychological pain is the same part of the brain that experiences physical pain. So it's real pain and then it's there, right? The only problem is sometimes psychological pain can linger on long, way longer than physical pain, right? So that's what we have to think about. So um, when we know that and we know how that feels, why do we continue to do those things to others as well? All right. So there are times when all of us have excluded others, you know, based on things that, you know, either we didn't like that person, um, you know, maybe their hygiene uh, standards aren't the same as yours. Um, you know, maybe they uh, hang out with somebody that you don't really approve of. And, you know, those different things. So we've done that. We've done times where we've friended people and we've unfriended people. Right. So why is it that after thousands of years, we are technologically advanced, but then we're still sociologically primitive. And so just think about that, right? So uh, understand that, you know, we all do this and it's just like, why do we do it? And so um, a lot of times when we don't like somebody, it's not necessarily that we don't like that person. Sometimes it's with us. Sometimes it's, you know, we have an unmet need and an insecurity of some sort. And that person's spirit is irritating our demons, all right? So we have something about us that we like, you know, I don't want nobody to know about this or I don't like this about myself. And this person over here tends to bring this out of me. And so that, those kind of things. Right. So, again, a lot of this has to do with us. So before we even start pointing the fingers at others and say, oh, this person just needs to change and stuff. Sometimes that changes to start with us and like really looking at ourselves and, you know, turning that mirror inward. 
Um, and so with others, right? And so sometimes people just don't like other people just because they're different from them or they think different, they dress differently, they may look differently, um, things of that nature. And so there's always gonna be differences, right? And so we need to understand that. And so, um, but there shouldn't be barriers. And so that's the thing. So yes, we're all different. We should embrace those differences because that's what actually makes us better, right? Um, you know, I don't know about you, but, you know, I don't like to eat the same thing every day. Um, I will if I have to, especially when I'm broke and I'm waiting for January to hurry up and end so I get my February paycheck, um, you know, so then that way I can get some food that I want instead of eating all these leftovers in the pantry. And I'm sorry, I, I, I digress. Um, so with that being said, um, again, there's going to be differences. Um, our differences uh, define us. Um, you know, diversity is a fact. Um, inclusion is a choice. And so how do we choose to be more inclusive of others that may just be different from us? And so this is a, a graphic I always like to share with people as well, because kids, you know, they don't necessarily, they just, you know, I have a seven-year-old son and, uh, you know, he'll play with anybody as, as long as they just want to play and, you know, have similar interests, he'll play with anybody. And so, but then why is it as adults, like we tend to like start, you know, self-segregating from others and things of that nature based off things we don't even know about. And like, it's different if you try to get to know somebody and then you just say like, hey, we're, you know, I don't like anything they like, and that's different. But a lot of us are making those judgments before we even open our mouths. So again, or communicate with them in another capacity. So again, why do kids, you know, why are they able to do this and we're not? So that's just something we just really need to look at ourselves for. So how do we improve uh, inclusion safety? Um, there's a guy named uh, Daniel, I think his last name is Kahneman or Kahneman. Um, he wrote a book, I think it's uh, Think Fast and Slow. And he talks about um, how everybody, you make a global impression of everybody that you meet. And that's based off of our biases and things of that nature, right? Um, that's human. That's being human. That's just what you do. The key to it, though, to rise above that is to consciously make an effort to do less of it, okay? And so that's what we want to try to focus on. So when you're meeting new people, like, are you judging them, like, right away and, like, what they, you know, who they are, what they're worth, things of that nature? And so, um, you know, how do you, how do you suppress that then? And how do you do less of it? And so it takes effort. It takes time because, again, unless you're taught to do that, you're not going to necessarily do that. And so um, there was some research at uh, MIT and their human dynamics lab, I think is the name of it. Yeah, human dynamics lab. Um, uh, they said that, uh, you know, the faster and deeper that we get to know each other, the more effectively we can work together, okay? And so there's a connection there, right? So it's, it's very, uh, you know, very primal where it's like, the more I, the more I get to know you and in in, in, in not the surface level stuff, right? Not the, hey, how you doing? And keep walking without even waiting for a response, right? But when I get to know like, hey, how are you doing? How are you doing today? We're probably gonna get more work done because I have a deeper connection with you. And so that was something that they uh, figured out at MIT. Um, so how do we improve, uh, improve inclusion safety? Uh, second thing is, you know, you only learn it by doing it. So the more you do it, the more you're more likely to believe in it and things of that nature. So, you know, if you find yourself not being as inclusive, uh, try to be more inclusive. And the more you do that, the easier it gets. It's just like everything else in life, right? The more we practice, the, the better we get at it. And the other thing too is like, as we love people with action, then, you know, you'll, your emotions will start to mirror what you're doing. Cause you know, it's very hard. It, there's another book um, called uh, How to Get People to Do Anything. And um, it, sound, it sounds terrible. The book sounds terrible, but it's actually a really good book because it just talks about, you know, when you're trying to get things done, how do you um, help people to like help you do them? And it said like a lot of times people think by asking, uh, by doing things for others, you know, they're more likely to like you. And it said it's actually the opposite. If you get people to do things for you, they're more likely to do it because subconsciously, if I'm putting in the time and effort to do something for you, I have to like you to do that. And so if you can ask people to do little favors for you here and there, and not saying abuse it, but if you do that, then they're more likely to uh, connect with you than if you're just always doing stuff for them. So just something to think about. But, um, but the more you do things for others as well, you know, it's always going to come back to you. So with this being said, I would like to open up um, uh, the whiteboard for, and so for those of you that have never used it before, let me, uh, give me one second. And can everybody see the whiteboard now? Yes, I think hopefully you can. Okay, let me make sure everybody can do, yep, you can, okay. So what you're gonna do is you see this whiteboard, what I would like you to do is if you go down to your options, um, uh, down at the bottom, You'll see something. Um, no, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, 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 sorry. You should see view 
uh, how you want to view this. And so when you see how to view this, let me make sure. Yeah. So it should be in the top right corner. There should be something that says view. Go ahead and click on view. I'm sorry. I am all over the place. I'm sorry. At the very top, you should see something that says view options. And in view options, you want to click on annotate. So in view options, you should see something that says annotate. If you can't see that, uh, put that in the chat or un unmute yourself and then I'll, I'll show you my screen so you can see it. And so once you see view options, you'll see annotate. What you're gonna do is come over here to the top um, where it says text and give me some examples of how you can be inclusive. Um, maybe things you've experienced where you were, in, uh, how you could, um, that you've experienced where somebody was being inclusive. Um, what are some things that I want us to share in here, thinking about everything we just, uh, I just talked about. What are some things that you know we can do to really help each other uh, be more inclusive to the people around us? Because that's the first step if we want to get to this highest level of our organization capabilities. And so, um, again, what are some things you could do? Uh, we'll do. We'll take about uh, ten minutes. No, nine minutes. We'll do nine minutes of a uh, sharing. So, again, if you go to view options, it should say annotate. Um, that will bring down this little menu. And in the menu, you should be able to, um, you should hit text and then it should allow you to start uh, typing stuff. Okay, somebody already jumped out there. That's what I'm talking about. I appreciate that. Mm, yes, because just because we can't be near each other doesn't mean we can't connect with each other, right? So yes. Mm, ask for others input and listen without judgment. Yes. Active listening when someone is speaking. Okay, yes. Yes, we have group text with everyone in the department, so everyone is involved and invited to lunch. Yes, yes. And um, please, as much as possible, I mean, you know, I know it may be challenging with some of your coworkers. Trust me, I know, all right? Um, but as much as possible, we got to figure out different ways that we can connect with folks and really just share with them, like, the things that, um, you know, because we, the minute you start excluding people, it's going to be so much harder for the rest of your um, time together to really do some in-depth work. Okay. Again, go back to the MIT uh, lab where they said like, you know, the more, the faster and deeper that we know each other, the more work we're going to be able to get done. And so, that, oh, I got a lot coming in. I really appreciate it. So celebrate employee differences. Yes. Create space for conversation. Yes. Uh, work collaborate on product projects. Be intentional about it. Ask others about themselves. Yes. Not look at title, but look at qualifications. Yeah, that is something that I am always um, advocating for. Because uh, even when I'm on a hiring committee or you know trying to figure out who the best person is for our, for the job, um, I tend to look more at um, ambition, and um, I look at skills and, and things like that. And, I, and don't don't get me wrong, I, I don't disregard experience, but I tend to put more weight into ambition and the desire to want to do the job and you know uh, wanting to connect with others. Um, cause in my, in my experience, I've, I've been on a number of committees where people just want to hire people cause they've had the most experience. Like, oh, this person has 20 years experience, you know, so they're going to know how to do this job. Well, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is, you know, some people have 20 years of experience and some people have one year of experience 20 times in a row. And so just because you've been around or things like that doesn't mean that you're great at it or that you even like to do it. So, you know, again, trying to figure out what that is and how important that is to your organization, um, is very, very important. Um, so let's see here, include all people in the conversation. Yeah, check in with those you don't usually talk to. Yes. And we can all connect with somebody on something, okay? There's at least something that we all can, um, you know, try to make some form of connection with and, and go from there. Be intentional, make sure everyone is prone to share ideas and make challenges. Yes. And here's another one. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I try to do, I, I, I could do a lot better with this as well, right? So one thing that um, I try to do a better job of is closing my mouth. Um, I'm an ex extreme extrovert. You know, I don't know too many strangers. I will talk to most people about anything, you know, and I'm always willing to listen and learn because I, I like learning that way. Um, but I also need to understand that can't suck all the air out the room. You got to let other people speak, especially people that just need a little bit more time to process. Um, and, you know, because I like to process out loud and word vomit and get things out. It helps me process through more and come up with ideas. 
everybody doesn't think like me, right? So that's part of that inclusion is making sure that we give people the space to, uh, you know, want to be, um, to uh, share and contribute and, and things of like that. So just make it sure. So if you're one of those people, uh, make note of that, okay? And if, as a matter of fact, if you're an extreme extrovert, I would highly recommend that you read uh, Susan Cain's Quiet, because um, that really, really helped me as far as like, you know, change some of the things I could to be more inclusive. So just throwing that out there. All right, so um, we got about three more minutes unless people are done. Um, oh, you know what I forgot to look at? And if you can't put the thing in annotate, if you want to put it in the chat, I'll move it over to this and um, we could we could put that in here. Um, let me see, where's the chat? Oh, there we go, okay. Okay, um, so for those of you um, on your screen, you should see, depending on the view you have it in, at the very top, it should say view options, um, or it might say it at the very bottom. And when you see view options, if you click on that little arrow, it should give you zoom ratio, request remote control, annotate, and then mute uh, the sound. Um, you may have to change the view that you have on it. So I would just maybe possibly do that. Yes, Blake. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, yeah. So again, just trying to be mindful of who we are and the, you know, how we project on the others, I think is just so important. And when we're thinking about our organizations, our divisions, our departments, like, again, how are we making sure that everybody's voice is being heard um, and is valued, not just heard, but valued. And so understand that that person is there for a reason, um, you know, and even if it's a reason you don't like or agree with, um, they're there. So how do we work within that and, you know, maximize our time and uh, efforts together? So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll, um, we'll come back to this. So again, after each safety, we'll come back to this board to figure out like, what are some ways we can do that? I really, really love a lot of these suggestions. Um, again, even asking about somebody's weekend starting a conversation, if that's the start of it, great. And then let's build on that, right? And so just really understand it. And again, that last one, you know, ask for input without judgment. I mean, that's so important, uh, especially when people, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a little bit, so. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop this year. And then we'll go back to Okay. All right. Can everybody see the presentation again? Yes. Okay. Where's my chat? There we go. Okay. All right. We good. Okay. All right. So uh, let's move on to the next one. Learner safety. So uh, learner safety um, is uh, all about once you feel like you're included in a space, you can sort of move into the next level, right? And so these things are sequential. So uh, you can move into this space. Now you can go back and forth between the safeties, but you need inclusion safety before you can actually reach the highest levels of learner safety. You can't be in learner safety without having inclusion because you need to know that I, you belong in this space. And when we really talk about inclusion safety, just to uh, finish up on that, uh, uh, part is that we're talking about, I appreciate you for you, not what you represent, not what you're worth, anything like that, any material possessions you have, that none of that matters. So Ms. Jones, because you jumped out there, I appreciate you for because you're Ms. Jones, right? Not because, oh, well, you know, um, you drive this type of car or, you know, you've had this much experience or, you know, um, you have this kind of inheritance, whatever it is. Um, so again, um, I appreciate you for you. And that's the biggest part about inclusion safety is really finding, you know, the, the diamond in the rough of everybody and understanding that, you know, everybody wants to feel important. How do we make those people feel important? Um, okay, so learner safety. So here's the thing with learner safety. If people don't have that inclusion safety where they're comfortable portraying themselves, then you're rarely going to get as much out of them, right? So with learner safety, um, how likely are you to be innovative when you're not sure if uh, respect and permission are around you? And so with learner safety, it's really, really important that you're allowed to learn in that space, make mistakes in that space without, you know, extreme detriments to, you know, who you are and things of that nature. Okay. So it's one thing for me to let you come in my house, but then the minute that, you know, 
you didn't hop to the to the to the next room because that's how we do things here and I ridicule for it, stuff like that you're not going to want to stay there okay you're more than likely you're going to be like I thought you said I was welcome in I said I let you in my door you know but it's like but if I didn't let, allow you to learn that that's not how we get from room to room around here um then that takes away from your learner safety so um, a lot of times, depending on the situation, projects that we're working on, working with each other, uh, maybe there's an event that we're all working to see, um, you know, you ask yourself these questions, okay? And so anytime we come into a new space, we ask ourselves internally this question in one form or another, right? So we start asking, like, will I look stupid if I ask this or do this, right? Uh, will people laugh at me if, you know, if that's important to you? Uh, will they ignore me? Um, will I hurt my prospects? Will I damage my reputation? So some of us, we like hold on to these ideas and we try to really process through them. And sometimes that can create a level of anxiousness. Uh, some of the, you know, the rest of us, um, it may happen in a blink, but it still happens. And so you're just sitting there like, oh, okay. You know, you're thinking like, should I say something or not? And again, if that learner safety is not there, wherever you are, it's gonna be harder to do some of these things. So again, um, if you don't, and you know, some of us don't care and you know, we'll say whatever we wanna say and that's fine, but everybody's not like that. So again, how do we make sure that we're allowing people to learn in the new environment, um, especially as new things happen, um, as COVID came up, you know, nobody, I, well, I don't know anybody alive that was knew about any pandemics or anything like that. So again, um, you know, when that happened, were we, did we give each other the space to really try to focus and like, how do we get through this? Or were we saying like, oh, that's a dumb idea. Don't ever bring nothing like that up. Um, no, we can't do this and things like that. Because then again, when, when that kind of stuff happens, people are less likely to share, which hurts the next uh, level. But are we allowing people to learn in that space and make mistakes? And so ask yourself this question as well. And so again, when you feel like you can make mistakes and you know you won't be ridiculed for it because people are looking for you to you know do better and they understand that it's part of a process, you're more likely to take bigger risk and things like that. If you remember what happens when we have high uh, psychological safety, people do more than what's being asked of them. That's what happens when you have uh, great learner safety. Okay, so let's talk about how we improve it. Um, here's just some ideas. Um, you know, just to ask you, have you ever had a supervisor, any of you had a supervisor in your life that, you know, created learner safety and pushed you to a new level of performance because they had that? So they were like, hey, I know this is new. I'm going to help you get through this. We're going to do this together. Um, how more, I mean, how likely are you to really put more effort into that when you get the, when you get that feeling and when you hear somebody saying that and they mean it and, and, and it's authentic, right? So again, yes, if, if I've had that, then, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more likely to do more. So um, how did that influence your motivation and effort? So just thinking about that. And then here's the thing, and this is just as simple as simple, but it's, it's true, right? And so it's a universal truth is that, you know, we'll learn more from people that we love than we don't. So when we have that connection with folks, we're more likely to do more with them, for them, um, you know, really work and go out of, you know, out of our way. Um, you know, it, it, just to use sports now, there are some people that will run through brick walls for their coaches because they feel like their coach believes in them, understands who they are, um, knows what they want and things like that. And they provide that environment for them to do that. And that's why they'll do that. Um, now, some people will do it for other reasons, but a lot of people, if they can make that connection, that is lasting. And, and you know, people will go above and beyond. So if you think about the work that you do in your department, in your area, your division, um, if you have this, you're doing more than what's being asked of you. Um, and some people, if they're just doing enough, they have their reasons, but a lot of times it's because they don't have that learner safety. And so this is the thing we really, really want to stress about it is that you have to, got to create the environment that failure is expected. It doesn't mean it's not fatalistic. Doesn't mean that you're never going to get another chance. Doesn't mean that, you know, this is the one shot you get. And if you mess it up, then you have to leave. We're going to fire you. We're going to find somebody else. Things like that. Hopefully none of you are in situations like that. If you are, uh, let me know. I'll try to help you find another job. Um, but if you if you're um, hopefully you're not in it and I'm being all serious. But if you are, um, you know, likely you're probably not given all your all because you don't have that environment to do those things. So with that being said, let's go back to the whiteboard. So I'm going to go back to the annotation. Uh, oh, I got to do it this year. There we go. All right. And then what we're going to do is I gotta why is it not showing me? 
Hold on, sorry. Okay, so we got a new board. And for those of you that know how to do this, uh, again, go to view options, click annotate, click on that text, start typing. Let's figure out some ways. What are some ways that somebody has either shown you and created learner safety for you? <coughs> Excuse me. Or what are some ways that we can do that going forward for others? What are some things that you could do? So if you can type some answers in there, we'd love to see what you could share. We'll do this for another couple minutes. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, just to see what uh, people can uh, share. So somebody put encourage ideas to be shared. Can you go a little bit deeper than that? Right, what do you mean? Like, is there a way to do that? Like, how can you do that? <coughs> Coach instead of criticize. Yeah, that's it. That's a good one. Um, you're right. Teachable moments for growth. Okay. So I got model the behavior, make your own mistakes and celebrate the learning. Yes. Yeah. And that's the thing. Sometimes people forget to give themselves grace. Right. So it's just Understand that you're part of this learning process. You don't have all the answers. We all started from somewhere. So uh, when we can start doing those type of things, it goes far. And again, if you're still unable to see the annotation, um, if you don't mind putting your answers in the chat, I will add it to the annotation because I really want everybody's input, as much input as we can get on this. Listen to ideas to improve culture and allow employees to run with it, yes. Okay. Oh, is that what's happening? Here we go. Okay. Yes, patience is a critical. Um, if a staff member feels supervised becoming impatient or annoyed with questions, we will choose the bottoms. Yep, we'll talk about that. <laughs> That's actually in the next one. Um, so that's actually uh, an outcome and a result of not having learner safety. Um, okay. Having a leader who's willing to role model, make mistakes and having learning opportunities is important. Yeah, so one of the things I do even with my people is I try to be as vulnerable and transparent as possible within reason. Um, so if there's something I'm comfortable with sharing, um, I tell people about my mistakes all the time. And I do that for two reasons. One is to just show people like, hey, it's okay. Like, you know, I, I mess up all the time, but then I just try to, you know, how, how can I make the solution? How can I find a solution? How can I make things better? Um, but I tell people all the time, like, unless, you know, for those of you that are able-bodied and able to walk, um, when you first started, I mean, you probably fell down a couple of times and that's just how it works. And so, you know, what can we learn from this? And then how do we do it better and, and just go from there? So, um, and again, I think it's also not putting people um, in uh, high stake situations from the jump, like building people up. So allowing them to make, you know, their own decisions and choices and mistakes and things like that. And then talking through it versus, you know, giving somebody a big project and when they fail, you're like, I'm never giving you nothing again. Right. So that's not learner safety. So um, just really, really thinking about, you know, how we can do this and, and what are some ways we can um, manage that uh provide different methods for sharing so people share in the way they are comfortable yes yes and i would even take that a step further and say even with recognition is trying to recognize people in the way they want to be recognized um not everybody likes public recognition right some people like to hey i'm cool sitting here in the background i like to do this work you know if you just tell me i did a good job that's enough for me um some people want the public recognition and that's you know that's fine as well so i think again allowing people to share in the way they want to share, but then also recognize that in the way they, they, they would like that as well. And again, that takes time. It takes, you know, a relationship and just really thinking through like how you can um, do all that. So, okay. All right. So we'll, um, oh, did I get one more? Try to be aware and respectful of cultural difference with communication. Some of you make may not eye contact when asking a question. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's very important. And that goes back to even the inclusion safety, right? The inclusive safety is just understanding that everybody doesn't communicate the same way. And again, but I think that takes getting to know each other and really just trying to understand that. So I think it's just, um, you know, uh, and we have 
a variety of cultural differences, but I think it, it never hurts to ask why or what people need and then trying to, you know, um, accommodate them to that as well, right? So just really, really understand it. Um, there's a book called um, uh, Why Smart People Could Be So Stupid, I think is the name of it. And it's like an anthology of different things about how people, like smart people make like really bad decisions. So it's, it's pretty good. It, it talks, it uses a lot of different stories to talk about things. Uh, one of the chapters is on um, uh, people with uh, disabilities. And uh, the author of the, the chapter was saying that when it comes to disabilities, um, it's okay to ask questions. Like questions don't hurt, assumptions do. And so just, that's always stuck with me. And so it's again, like ask questions because that's the only way we can get to know more about each other and then how to navigate certain situations. But if you're still stuck on, you know, your silence order, like that can take you away. So yeah, oh yes, me, that is a great example. Ability to admit when you need to do further research. That is, yeah, again, not faking like you know the answer, um, because that does nothing but diminish your credibility. So again, when you can uh, admit that, hey, I don't have the answer right now, but I'm willing to work with you to do it. Um, they say the most powerful, um, one of the most powerful things you can do as a leader, if any of you, uh, and all of you are leaders in your own capacity, right? But as a leader, one of the things you could do is, uh, you know, just tell people like, I don't know, but I'm willing to learn. And so don't focus so much on what you, your expertise, but focus more on your capacity to want to know more and figure out, you know, the solution. And if you're willing to do that with somebody, that goes a long way. So from there, we'll, uh, Thank y'all for again contributing uh, very greatly to this, and so I really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and move this to the third one, and then that one when we come back to it, we can. Um, uh, we can yeah, there we go. Okay, so um, and then when we go to the third one, we can have some more stuff to go. And so um, here's the other thing I want to tell you: um, as you get uh, further along in the psychological safety and trying to create these environments, it does get tougher. Okay, so. It's one thing to have people included. I think it's super important uh, to make that make people feel that then, you know, to give them the space to learn and make mistakes. That's, you know, in itself as well. And then now we're going to talk about the next one, which is contributor safety. OK, and that gets a little bit tougher. And the last one is really, really tough. And y'all, most of the time when I do this presentation, people struggle with that last one. But we're, we're, we're going to work through that. OK, so with that being said, um, contributor safety. All right. So. Um, the thing I really want to talk about with contributor safety is your heart has got to be in it and you got to be willing to give up your heart. OK, um, it's not something. And so a lot of times, especially in like business and different organizations, depending on the time of year it is and stuff like that, um, when you hired somebody or things like that, a lot of times people focus on like we just got to get this work done and then, you know, we'll worry about everything else. And so these two Australian uh, researchers did some research and they found out that there's a lot of supervisors, leaders, and, and managers that are like, I don't have time to try to get to know these folks on that level. So we just got to get this work done. But what they found out was that the people that did take that time, even if it was costly up front, it made way more, uh, for, uh, the return on investment was way higher in the end, in the long run. So yeah, so short term, you know, you may get some work done, but then your people are going to feel like they're being used. Um, they don't feel appreciated, things like that. Like, yeah, you may have gotten a project done, things like that. But if they didn't get the, if they feel like you didn't get to know them or they were able to contribute, then that takes away from the long term success. Right. So that's why I want. So, again, uh, that's what this picture is. It's like, you know, you have got to take the time to try to get to know your people and know them well. And, and when we can make them feel included, allow them the space to learn and make mistakes without being ridiculed or ostracized then we can start getting contributed, which is where they're willing to give of themselves and give you more than what you're asking for, okay? And so, um, and, and here's the thing, if you don't have that, then, you know, employers are gonna be worrying more about their um, their safety as far as their psychological safety and, and versus their performance. So they're gonna spend more time like, oh, you know, like, does my boss not like me? You know, am I, do I have a future here? Um, am I going to get other opportunities to show what I know and things like that? And when they don't have that, they shut down. That's where that shutdown comes from when people don't feel like they can contribute. And so one of the things I want you to think about is how we can improve it. And so a lot of times people don't even realize this, but I, I like to bring it to light is um, uh, your facial expressions. OK, so sometimes you may not be saying anything but your face is always talking, okay? And so it's always sending a message to people. It's always telling people how you feel. Um, and unless you have some kind of 
you know, you're surrounded by mirrors at all times, or, you know, you have some magic way where you always know what your face is doing. Um, a lot of times we're missing out on, on uh, how we're communicating non-verbally, right? And so when it comes to contributor safety, when people want to come to you and share an idea, um, you got to make sure that you're in the right headspace to show them that you're willing to accept it. Um, I'm not saying that you got to smile the whole time because that's fake as well. But at the same time, it's like, um, you know, you got to make them feel welcoming and, and, and be warm. And so then people are more likely to share. OK, now different contexts, different circumstances, you know, you may not have time to do that. But when you can, we need to try to make that. So really, really, really be cognizant of how your face looks when people are sharing their ideas, um, because we all have this uh, self-regulation within us, this internal regulator. And it's very sensitive to how people treat us. OK, so depending on your experience and, you know, what you've been through, uh, especially, you know, past jobs, past relationships, uh, the environment you grew up in, uh, you have something that tells you, like, this is the time I should speak and this is the time I shouldn't. OK, and it's really dependent on what your past experiences were. So um, you really need to think about that. And then if you're also if you're in a position of leadership or you're a supervisor, manager, whatever it is, um, one of the questions you can help yourself, like ask yourself to help with contributor safety is why would anybody want to be led by you? And so you really need to ask yourself that question, because sometimes people think like, well, I'm, I'm in charge. They should want to listen to me and things like that. Um, if that's a foreign concept to you, I would highly recommend reading uh, John Maxwell's book of the five levels of leadership, where it talks about the different reasons people follow others. And so that's just one of those things where it's like, do you want people to follow you because you're the authority and because they have to? Um, now, people will do what you say because, you know, you, you may in an authority position. People won't follow you unless you're leading them. OK, and so there's a huge difference. If you don't understand that difference between authority and leadership, then that's another conversation I'm willing to have with you just to you know, further explain. It. And there's a bunch of resources out there. But again, just because you have a title um, doesn't make you a leader. It does give you an opportunity to be one, but uh, it doesn't make you like automatically like, oh, you have great leadership and stuff like that because you have this title or you're in charge. So just think about that. Um, and again, you got to get to know your people. And the more you get to know your people, uh, the deeper and faster you get to know your people, the more you're going to be able to get out of them. Um, and so, and then, you know, and, and do that because you care about them, not because you need to use them for, uh, to get some work done, right? Because you really care about them. So that's just, um, something to think about. So with that being said, with contributor safety, let's go back to the whiteboard. Uh, whoops, let me share, sorry. Um, and so hopefully everybody can see that again. Um, So Blake, no, you're absolutely right, right? So it's the, the uh, angry person looks like he's focusing. Um, that's possible, but that takes a, a conversation to make sure to see where people are at. And, and what that means is that before we start talking about something that you know maybe we need to work on a project together, get something done, ask and check it in with somebody. Like, how are you doing? And really waiting for the answer to find out how they're doing, okay? Um, and giving people time. They say like the best uh, leaders, what they do is they ask, and then sometimes they, you know, somebody gives them an answer how they're doing, but then they wait a little bit longer to see if that person's willing to offer more. And sometimes when they're willing to offer more, you get the real story behind it. Okay. Um, there's an excellent book. Um, his name is John Powell. I think it is. I read it a while back. Um, Why am I afraid to show you who I am is the name of the book. And it's a tiny little book. It's like a hundred pages, but it's amazing. And it really talks about the levels that we're at to really share with people and then get people to share with us. And so it really talks about, um, you know, those type of things. So it's really, it's really, it's a really good book to read if, if you have time to read it. But, uh, but yeah, but it really says that, hey, really getting to know somebody and really understanding like where they're at, who they are, doesn't mean you're going to solve all their problems. But a lot of us, we just want to be heard. Okay. And so it doesn't mean that we're looking for solutions. Sometimes, sometimes we just need to vent. Um, I know I have to do that from time to time, you know, uh, luckily, I have a very understanding partner, uh, you know, and we do that for each other. Right. So, again, just not trying to definitely come up with solutions, but definitely to listen to each other. Just as sometimes you get that out and you're good. So um, now if she needs a, a, a solution or if I need a solution, then we ask for that. Like, oh, do you have a thought or a solution on it? And then the other person can share. But sometimes we just let it be get it out. Um, so, yes. So on the whiteboard, if you could see it, um, if you could, please. Uh, this is going to be a little bit tougher, but let's think about ways that we can encourage those around us how to contribute. Uh, what are some ways that things that people have done for you that made you feel like you, you could contribute? What are those? And so can we put that on this uh, whiteboard and just type those in? And so again, remember, go to view options, go to annotate, 
and then it should allow you to um, type some answers in. And we'll spend a couple of minutes doing that. Hmm. Yeah. Co-facilitate doing a project, co-create. That's a really, really excellent uh, example. Hmm. Isn't that some Stephen Covey stuff? Uh, start with smaller informal breakout sessions where ideas flow more freely to bring to large group. Yeah. Um, there's another um, book, one of my favorites, um, Marshall Goldsmith, uh, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And uh, it's one of my favorites because he talks about um, the uh, things that we do that sort of sabotage our own like experiences and relationships. And that just reminded me with sharing the formal, informal uh, sessions is that we've got to be careful one of the first things he talks about that sabotage you is winning all the time. And so that's when somebody shares something with you and then you try to one up them uh, based on the experience you had. So uh, you, you just don't say, you know, somebody tells me like, oh, I just came from Disney World. I had a great time. And then you follow up with, oh, I've been to Disney World five times. So what you're doing is you're trying to win. Um, and most people do this subconsciously. They don't maliciously. There are some people that do it maliciously, but that's just who they are um, or not who they are, but how they're being their behavior. Um, but anyway, so again, allowing people to win. And so when somebody shares something with you, let them have that victory. Like, okay, you went to this one. Oh, that was great. Did you have a great time? Great. Even if I've been five times, it's like, okay, did you have a great time? Tell me your favorite part, things of that nature. And that's one of the things that can definitely allow us to build um, um, better connections. And then I'm going to tell you this too, uh, just because I've read a lot, a lot of material on uh, uh, women in leadership and some of the difficulties they have when they're in those spaces because of the um, unreal expectations that are required of them when they're in those uh, positions of leadership. And so uh, one thing it talks about is, you know, um, and I'm generalizing, but, you know, if you identify as a male, making sure that you're not taking credit and uh, allowing, um, you know, uh, those that identify as female to have space to be able to share their ideas and encourage them to share their ideas and not taking credit for some of that stuff as well. So again, uh, just really, really you know, take it because sometimes we do that, talk over them, uh, things of that nature. Don't, you know, try to limit that as much as possible, if not do it at all. But um, and there's some apps out now that can really uh, help you start to really do that. So um, one thing I was taught is and when I get in the meetings um, as a dean, uh, something that I was taught was speak the least and speak last. And so then that way you're encouraging others to share, because depending if that safety is not there, Sometimes people don't share everything they want because they want to see what you have to say first and then they'll follow. That's not a good environment for you. That's not contributor safety, okay? You want to try, if you're a person in charge, speak the least. That means you're doing more listening. And then also at the same time, let's um, you know, allow other people to um, uh, share their like ideas and things like that. And then that way you can formulate things like that. Uh, another great idea, one of my, um, one of my favorite coworkers, she had posted a quote from something and say like, when you're coming to a meeting, uh, don't bring the cathedral, bring a brick, okay? And so what that means is that come with an idea. Don't come with it all already solved that you just want other people to buy in because that's another uh, word they say we need to stop using is buy-in because that means that it's already been uh, created. You just need to get on board, right? So it's like, no, 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 no. You'll get more out of people when you get them part of the process. Uh, one of my other favorite quotes says, you know, uh, the best way to get people to eat the chili is to let them help you make it, right? So um, when we have people that we're bringing in, and, and you know, er again, everybody's there for a reason. Everybody has a skill set. Allow them to actualize their skill set and really promote it as much as possible. Um, and that will radiate through your whole decision process, your brainstorming, and you'll come up with a better product 
when you're able to do that kind of stuff versus just saying like, oh, we're going to do this and this and this. Now tell me how you want to do it. And it's like, it's, it's a lot less likely to get those kind of things done. So just something to think about. But I'm loving, um, yes, be available. Yes. Uh, a lot of folks to be, yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, some of these are in depth. I didn't expect y'all to get this in depth, but I appreciate y'all for doing that because this, this is looking good. So I, I, I like this. So we'll give a couple more minutes. Um, let's do two more minutes if people are still typing or have something else that comes to mind. And so one more thing is um, that I will add before we move on is a mentoring. So as much as possible, you know, if you don't mentor anybody right now, try to offer your services to, uh, to other folks. Uh, if you see somebody that, you know, looks like they're, you know, on the rise to, you know, they, they have a, like a future in what you're doing, um, mentor them. And I mean, hopefully they have more than one mentor. Um, so then that way you can possibly be one of them. Um, and I always say like, try to mentor somebody and then also make sure that you have mentors um, as much as possible and try to get as many different ones, right? So I have three different mentors that all um, identify differently in multiple capacities. And the reason I do that is because then that way when I need support or need uh, feedback, I have different three different ways to uh, look at it you know, outside of my own way of looking at it that I can get that support to try to make the best decision possible. Doesn't mean it's gonna be perfect, and, you know, hopefully, you know, my uh, people that I report to give me that learner safety uh, to make mistakes. But at the same time, at least it gives me a chance to learn something new and how to do it. So, OK, well, we'll move on. And again, I appreciate y'all uh, sharing um, this. And so the last one that we're going to cover is. Where is it? No, that's not it. There we go. OK. All right, there we go is challenger safety. So this one is really tough. And so um, the book that this presentation was based off of, it says that a lot of organizations rarely get to this, okay? Rarely get to this. As an organization, there may be certain pockets that get to this, but a lot of uh, people rarely get to this as an organization, division, or department, okay? Um, and it's difficult to get to because you have got to have people feel like they're included, you have to have people feel like they're allowed to learn. And, uh, and not, we're not just talking about feel like you actually have that available for them to do those things. And then when people feel like they can contribute, um, then and, and, and contrib uh, contributing safety is so important because here's the thing. If people don't feel like they can contribute, they start to look for other places where they can. OK, that's just natural. That's what happens. People shut down and they're like, OK, if I can't contribute here, uh, it makes me feel like, you know, I'm not valued, things of that nature. People start looking for other jobs. They start looking for uh, other ways to do other things outside of what they are maybe uh, being asked to do. So, again, just thinking about that, that's why contributor safety is so important. Challenger safety. Challenger safety is vital. OK, if you really want to reach that highest level, of whatever the people that you're working with. All right. And so. What happens when we don't have challenger safety? Uh, again, people, no, number one, challenger safety is when you're allowed to challenge the status quo of something without repercussions, okay? Um, without retaliation. So you're allowed to say like, hey, I don't think, I think we could do a better job of this, this, and this. And you're not worried about people saying like, oh, be quiet, or, you know, we're not gonna, you know, listen to what you have to say or anything like that. And so challenger safety is very, very important. Um, when we do, and, and, and the reason why it's so important and it's so hard to get to is because everybody remembers a time that they had a painful experience, they tried to share something, and then they got ridiculed or berated for it, okay? And so whatever that was, whether that was from a parent, um, a family relative, a teacher, um, an old boss, something like that, um, you know, uh, excellent relationship, uh, you know, you were like, hey, I don't, you know, I think this could be better or something like that, and you got, you know, berated for it, oh, you remember that. And so because of that, you're more you're less likely to do it again. And so the thing we have to do with challenge safety is assure our people as much as possible um, that they, you know, we would encourage them to have candor and we, we, we will tell, you know, just reinforce that, you know, I want you to share, even if I don't like it, I want you to share that. So I'm going to tell you uh, something that I started doing last year. And even for me, as much as I as open minded as I like to think I am, 
even for me, it was a little bit tough uh, because I read something that said, if you really want to be a great leader, ask your people not only how you can serve them better, but ask them to tell you something you don't want to hear. Now, what you think about that? You're asking people to tell you something that you don't want to hear or they think you might not want to hear. OK, that's tough. Um, I heard some things and I was like, wow, I definitely need to do a better job of that. There were some other things where I was like, oh, OK, that that makes sense to me. Like, I definitely will try that. Um, but yeah. But and when I tell you, number one, you know, you have challenger safety when your folks can actually do that. Um, if they're not willing to do that at all, then that, that sends a message to you that you're, you got some work to do to build up those other three safeties to get them there. OK, because if you can get people there to challenge your safety, you're going to get more out of them, whereas they're going to be willing to take more risk and, uh, you know, really try to find ways. And remember, if they have learner safety, contributor safety, they're going to be doing this. Uh, they're going to go above and beyond without you being without you telling them to. OK, so, again, that is just so important that if you can get to that place. All right. Um, because if people don't have that cover and you want them to be candid, um, more than likely they're going to be focused on you know, defensive tactics on like, how do I save myself? Or, you know, my remember those questions that say like, will I be ridiculed, will I be laughed at? You know, what will this cost me? Those type of things are gonna creep back in if we don't have this kind of safety. And so, um, and it's so important to have this. And again, if you don't have this, it's harder to get to the best product that you have because, um, you know, there's a lot of different examples. Um, in the military, they used to have what was called red teams. And so anytime there was a strategy that was being put forward, uh, they would have a red team, which was an assigned group of individuals that would come in and try to pick it apart. And they would tell you all the reasons why it wouldn't work. And the reason they did that is because they wanted a better strategy, a better product. And so uh, NASA does that. They have a team of people that do that. I can't remember the name of their team. But um, anytime they're trying to create something, they have a group of folks that come in and they're not doing that to be hurtful and malicious and things like that nature, but they do that to really try to make the product better. The, the way I like to think about it is like sandpaper, okay? So it's like you need sandpaper to make unfinished wood uh, usable, right? So again, be, you know, how do you how do you create an environment where people can be sandpaper and not worry that it's going to cost them their career or cost them any um, um, professional capital that they may need? And so something to think about, what I want you to think about is, um, have you ever tried, when was the last time you made a mistake and then tried to cover it up? And what made you do that? What made you do that? So when was the last time you made a mistake and then tried to cover it up and what motivated you to cover it up? So just something to think about. And so another part of uh, challenger safety, sometimes it gets in the way of it. For those of you that may be in leadership positions or have titles and things like that, there's a concept called um, unnecessary paternalism. And that's when, you know, uh, those people in those positions are constantly telling people what to do, um, how to do it. Um, the other colloquial term is micromanaging, right? And so the, the reason that gets so frustrating is because either you get used to it or you get away from it, right? And so, um, and if you get used to it, it's because, you know, uh, you've been taught to, you know, be servile and, and, and compliant um, or you were forced to be. And so again, you didn't have that challenger safety to be able to say like, hey, this is not right. Um, you just go with it. And you know, sometimes people are like, I got bills to pay. I ain't got time to be challenging other people and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, that may be that that may hold on temporarily, but at some point you're gonna burn out from that, or that other person is gonna um, you know, uh, break whatever you're doing. So again, um we um we all need to be mindful. If you've been through the situation, you already know. Um, but if you haven't, um, good for you. And so for those of you that have been in that situation where you had somebody that was always on you telling you what to do, how to do it, um, that was frustrating in itself. I, I know for me, the time that I was like really, really going through with, with somebody like that, um, I, immediately I started looking for that. I didn't want to share anything else. Uh, every idea I had, I didn't want to share. And I, I'm an ideas guy. I need other people to tell me which ones are good and which ones are bad. But if I get to a point where I don't want to share any ideas, it's because there was some situation that put me into that. And so again, um, that challenger safety is so important. And they say the best organizations um, have that challenger safety. And that's a big part of that psych psychological safety. So again, um, this unnecessary paternalism, micromanaging, it can help you in the short term, but it grows dangerous in the long term. Okay, so um, because basically what you're doing is you're cutting people off from them being able to share their own ideas, um, take a risk and things of that nature. So how do we create more challenger safety? Um, again, get rid of that paternalism. Understand that people need to do things the way they 
know how to do them and, you know, things like that. It may not be done exactly how you want it done, but as long as it's getting done, that's what, you know, really matters. As long as it's, you know, following all ethical and, and legal uh, guidelines. Um, encourage people to be straight up with you. Again, if you are, if you are for it, you're willing to take that risk. Ask people to tell you something you don't want to hear and see what happens um, if you can. And not just, you know, your supervisor. I'm talking about coworkers. Like, tell them that kind of stuff, too. Like, tell me something I don't want to hear. And uh, if you can create that type of environment, you're going to get so much more out of it. And it's tough, but uh, it can get you to where you need to be. Um, when you create challenger safety, it, it allows innovation to be expansive. I mean, uh, it just continues to grow. Uh, people are willing to, you know, really think through some things. Uh, how can we make this better? Um, and they're not as afraid. OK, so, again, um, if you're in a position of leadership or you're the person that's calling the meetings and things of that nature, you know, inviting that in. Um, and again, within reason. Right. There are some people that just want to complain to complain. And we, you know, I think we all may know somebody like that. Hopefully you're not that person and you're on this call. Um, but again, um, there are people that complain and, you know, just to complain. And there are other people that complain because they want things to be better. Let's look at that. Let's try to give people benefit of the doubt that they want things to be better and how we can do that. Um, and so how do we encourage people to do that? OK, um, when we don't, it really, really hurts us when we don't have people that are willing to share what they have. And so, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't go back. Sorry. One last time, we're going to do the, the, the whiteboard um, for folks. Uh, sorry. Okay, so one last time, this is in regards to challenger safety. Um, has there ever been a time where somebody gave you challenger safety? Have you given people challenger safety? Um, what are some ways that you can, uh, <laughs> don't take this, okay. <laughs> Wait, are you telling me that or are you just using that as an example? If you're telling me that, I, I, I'm okay with that, okay? I understand something. Oh, uh, the question, um, what are some ways that we can encourage challenger safety? Um, what are some ways in the past maybe you've experienced challenger safety? So either one of those. So if it's something you've been through before, what was it that you know, got you to that challenger safety? Um, and then you know, if you have some ideas on how you can create that. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. And again, if you can't annotate, if you want to put it in the chat, I will throw it up there in the annotation so we can come back to it. Mm. I hear you on that. Um, so somebody in the chat said, in the past, I was an organization that liked to think it was providing challenge safety, but it was brainstorming in one retreat a year and nothing actually came of it. Yeah. Um, so in the book, um, and I appreciate that comment, in the book, he talks about uh, higher ed organizations and the mistakes that they make. And um, he talks about higher ed and hospitals, but he mainly was focusing on higher education. He said, one of the things they are guilty of and notoriously do is that they'll ask for feedback, ask for ideas on how to improve something, um, take the time to listen to it, allow you to brainstorm, work on it, things like that. Thank you for your time and do nothing with it. OK, and that is that is so deflating for those people that have taken the time that, you know, wanted to put that through and, and go from there. So, again, and, and yeah, and somebody just put and don't fake it. Right. So, yes, um, allow people to give of themselves. Remember, those four things was like one of them was, again, we all long to belong and people want to give. And so, um, yeah. Uh, oh, OK, that's that's fair as well. Um, I have had challenger safety in certain uh, positions. Um, and, and again, this is not an all end all or be all, right? It's not like one or the other and you know nothing else. Um, again, just to be transparent, in my current position, uh, I have uh, some challenger safety, um, some things I don't. And again, it's just, uh, and, and, and to be fair, 
I have new supervisors and I have new responsibilities. So it was trying to build up to that. Um, but I've been in jobs where I didn't have, I had zero challenger safety, um, where I had zero contributor safety. And then I've had other jobs where um, I've been able to just speak my mind and say what I wanted to say. And so, um, yeah, it, and there's a huge difference in production out of me, depending on which one I get. And then somebody, the road to communication has to be clear and concise. We only have to have an open mindset, but open and constructive criticism. Yes. Okay. And, and here's the thing too, with challenger safety, I, and I use this uh, analogy in um, my other equity trainings as well, you know, just to help people understand this, is that just because you do something differently doesn't mean that it's wrong. Okay. Um, the analogy I always like to use is six plus three is nine, but so is five plus four. Okay. But we need to be able to still share that with one another, all right? And so it doesn't mean that either one of those is wrong. It just means like, hey, there may be a different way. But again, with that challenge, at least we know that. And so that's why that's so important to be able to like create that environment for those folks. And so think about that. Think about how you do challenge safety. Like for those of you with children, do you allow your children challenge your safety? Um, or do you tell them, nope, it's my way or the highway? Um, in your relationship, for those of your relationships, uh, you know, just think about that. And so think about that. Your, your colleagues, um, if a student comes and says like, hey, I have a, I have a, um, a challenge. I want to challenge this because I think it could be better. How do you accept that information? Um, do, do, you, do you take it openly? Do you just like listen, nod your head and know that you're never going to uh, accept it? Um, or do you open, are you open to it and say like, oh, yeah, I, I definitely want to be better at this, right? And so, again, I know this one's a little bit tougher just because, um, especially for those of you who have never experienced it, right? So I'm just thinking is um, mm, child safety and parent-child relations connect to secure attachment. Okay. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save these boards. And when we send the, um, the presentation to all of you, uh, the recording, uh, you'll be able to go back through these boards and, you know, think some more. Because, again, I know this is kind of rushed. We only had 90 minutes. And, you know, uh, some people need a little bit more time to think through these things. I get it. It's just, you know, we have 90 minutes, so we're trying to get through it. Um, but, yeah, please feel like uh, you definitely can go back. There's some things you want to, like, think through, you want to share later. I'm open to hearing because I love learning from other people. So um, others put people in positions they don't want to be in because of lack of consideration. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Uh, for those of you that may be familiar with, uh, uh, what is it? Um, uh, leader member exchange theory. It says you're either always in the inside group or the outer group. And so there's pluses and minuses to both. Um, outer group, you don't get to learn new things or get opportunities, but at the same time, you don't have as much pressure on you to perform. And then people on the inner group, you know, they get more pressure because they're getting more opportunities and because they know about things a little bit closer. So, um, of course, more people will want to be on, but th that goes back to being included, you know, that inclusive safety and getting people to feel like, you know, th uh, they can contribute. And so all of that is tied together. So, okay, well, we'll go, um, we'll go back to what we were looking at and wrap this up. Um, okay. So in summary, um, psychological safety is when you feel included, it's, you know, it's okay to learn, uh, you can give of yourself and then you're allowed to challenge, right? And so again, it's not easy, um, but number one, how do we do this for each other? But even more important is how do we do this for ourselves, right? Because there are some things that, you know, when we talk about inclusive safety, except in all parts of yourself, all right? Um, understanding, you know, you got to love yourself before you can love others. So understanding that, giving you a chance to learn without, you know, uh, not being uh, afraid of success and, you know, uh, really trying different things and new things, all right? Um, because of COVID, I know all of us had to try things that we probably didn't even think we were going to have to do and, and, and go from there. Um, contribute, okay? Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to do it verbally. Uh, there are other ways you could do it. Um, you know, maybe you're great at writing. Maybe you're great at putting projects together, uh, working with others. So again, but make sure that you're still giving of yourself. And then last but not least, speak up when you can. 
Um, it's not always easy, but we have to do it. That's one thing we make things better. Um, if you don't know, I mean, you got to think about it as measurements, right? So, you know, if you don't know uh, where you're at or how you compare uh, to your goals and things like that, then how do you know you're actually doing something or doing better? And so if you think back to like smart goals, for instance, so um, and if you can do all that without being embarrassed or marginalized, punch, ostracized in any way, then that's when you know you have psychological safety, right? And so again, we all long to belong. And the, the last thing we'll leave you with, well, two last things. Oh, the second to last is uh, their relationships make us happy and healthier. So there's a longitudinal study uh, done by Harvard on uh, human happiness. And so they go through and they like, they've been following these people for 75 years. And, you know, of course, until they either pass away or, um, and so, you know, they just always record like what makes them happy. And so they found out that the one thing that makes people uh, live longer than anything else uh, even, you know, if you take out diet, exercise, things of that nature, some genetics, things like that, the one thing that keeps people uh, alive longer than anything is their connections to others, okay? So again, we have a good relationship with folks. We, we live better because we feel better. Um, you know, we do more things of that nature, okay? So again, if we can um, uh, maintain those connections, we're going we're, we're gonna to get a lot more out of folks and, and out of ourselves. And so just think about that. Now, uh, one question I always get asked is, what happen if I'm in an organization or in a situation, a department, things like that, where I can't obtain psychological safety, okay? Uh, the one thing I tell you is just, even if you can't make connections with others and other people just don't want that, or, you know, your department and whoever's running it has no, um, no um, um, interest in trying to, uh, you know, create psychological safety, one thing you can do is love yourself first. And what that may mean is stepping away, uh, figuring out how do you take care of yourself until you can get to a place where you can change your circumstances, okay? Um, so again, but don't ever stop loving yourself because the minute you do that, then, you know, all hope is lost. So again, try to love yourself through those situations. Understand that, you know, hopefully they're temporary. Uh, you'll get to where you need to be at the same time, still helping other folks get to where they need to be. And so again, um, as much as possible, um, you know, take care of yourself. Um, and then as, as you take care of yourself, take care of others, you know, try to provide these safeties, do what you can to contribute to these safeties so that that way other people feel this and then hopefully it becomes reciprocal and a, a reciprocal cycle and the, it keeps going and going, okay? So with that being said, I have greatly, greatly, greatly appreciated uh, all of you uh, for being here and uh, again, providing those uh, answers to those uh, to the whiteboard. I would definitely get that to you. Um, I'll get you the recording with the whiteboard answer. So you can look back through them and just think through like, okay, if maybe you saw something on there that you're like, oh yeah, that's something maybe I want to try. Um, I agree with this. I disagree with this because that's part of challenge safety, right? Like I disagree with that and that's fine as well. Um, you know, as long as you can just talk about why you do disagree with it. Um, so I need two things from you. One, as I just put a link in the chat, that's to the post assessment. Um, it, uh, it's like, It'll take you three to five minutes to complete that. And it's just definitely for us to get feedback about, you know, what these, this presentation, you know, how we can make it better, things of that nature. So please be candid. Uh, we encourage candor. Uh, if there's something you really like, talk about that. If there's something you dislike, talk about that. We want all of it, okay? Because that's the only way I can get better, the only way that our center can get better in the things that we offer. So please, if you could take some time and do that. Um, for the uh, rest of you, if you can, I'm going to, there's one handout that I want to give you. And it's sort, it's, um, geared towards psychological, um, the inclusive safety. And so it's all about inclusion. It talks about like, it's built off a, another uh, model called the commit model. And what it does, it allows you to evaluate yourself as far as like who you are and how you can be more inclusive with others. And so it has a DEI lens to it, um, but it's applicable to everything. So when you get a chance, uh, if you go to that link, um, that'll take you to the document to see the uh, commit model. If you click on the top of the link, that takes you to the presentation and this presentation. And so you can go back to the presentation if you want to. And maybe there's something else you had a question because there was a bunch of questions in there. If you want to go back and answer, you can do that. So um, please, if you can, definitely do the, um, the post assessment. That second link uh, that's on the, on the screen right there, that screen is, uh, I mean, that link will take you to the document for the commit, which is, uh, is, is, and it can get tough to answer some of these questions, but it's well worth it. Okay, I promise you it's well worth it. Um, and so as a matter of fact, let me just make sure this gets us to, okay, here we go. Is that good? Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, yeah, so if you just click on this link, that takes you back to the presentation, but these are just questions that you can ask yourself. Um, and it comes from Diversity Beyond Lip Service by Lawana Harris. 
And so that's what this model is uh, coming from. But again, I found it very beneficial to really think about, you know, myself and my professional life, um, you know, and then it helps you think through some things and how you can be better and uh, uh, resolve some things. So that being said, uh, and again, these things are available to you. If you want some additional resources, please let me know. Um, I have a bunch of stuff that I can give you. If there's one aspect of this that you're more interested in the others, please let me know. Um, you know, sometimes after I've done this presentation, we have folks like ask like, okay, um, I'm a supervisor. I have some folks that work for me and I'm trying to really figure out how I can get them to contribute more, um, how I can get people to feel like, you know, it's a learning environment. Um, there's a number of articles that, you know, I have um, and some like book chapters and stuff like that I can send you to like really help you talk through some of those things, questions you can ask folks, things like that. So um, just let me know if you're really interested in that kind of stuff and I'd be glad. That's my email address. Uh, feel free to contact me if you got any feedback, any questions, you want to carry on the conversation, let me know and I'll be glad to support you. Uh, and then last but not least is this is the book uh, where all this really came from. And so if you pick up the book, you'll see a lot of this stuff in there. Plus more, he gives a lot more information. I was just trying to summarize some of that stuff in 90 minutes. So that's what that is. Um, but there you go. So again, you have the presentation, you have the uh, post assessment, please go ahead and fill that. And we'll open it up for questions. I mean, I'll stay on uh, for the next 15 minutes. Uh, if not, you're free to, you know, go ahead and uh, leave. But if, if not, I appreciate you being here. But if you have any questions, let's talk. Uh, you know, it's open. Um, and so I'll close this screen so I can see people if you want to open up your camera as well. But if you have any questions, anything like that, feel free to share. Okay, there we go. 